my little friend Peanuts actually got something to say about the, uh, the current mindset of uh, buildings. Fine city. <laughs> Playing in a very nice theater. <laughs> this town is great. Okay, so we still think it's perfectly normal to have these in our homes, stairs. Why? They're spatially inefficient, they're dangerous. I mean, why do you have a rail at the top to stop your kids falling down them? It's just nonsense. People over a certain age can't even use them. Homes are clearly not currently designed to be lived in. <laughs> but hey, as long as they look good. It, it seems normal, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's even considered traditional and beautiful that, you know, for many, um, a mind shaped by this culture. In time to come, as values and attitudes towards the intelligent and sustainable management of the world's resources change, we won't be thinking the same way we are now. That's pretty clear. The homes that Jacques designs... I think my partner wants that one. Uh, as seen in our latest 3D renderings, which you can see in the exhibition uh, next door. These houses are conceptual, but they are based on design criteria as laid out by the Venus Project. They only reflect what the houses of the future may look like. You're not, you're not going to be forced to live in this one if you don't like it. You know, it's, it, homes will be designed for you specifically, for your needs. Each home would be designed for the needs of the inhabitants of that home. For example, someone who loves cooking and hosting dinner parties, for example, they might want a large kitchen and a big dining room. Um, not everyone would want that. You know, I'm a bit of a computer nerd. I like to sit behind my computer doing my 3D animations and stuff. You know, this is all quite daunting for me. I'm not really a good cook. Um, not big on dinner parties. Getting better. <laughs> so that kind of home would not suit me. I'd like something with a study where I can do my robotics and play around with my computers and things like this, you know. Um, so it's quite clear that we all have our own individual needs based on our own individual personal habits, our own individual personal desires, things that we like to do, our hobbies, etc. So our homes really need to be designed with that in mind. 
Um, and you can't standardise that. You know, you can't, you can't carry on standardising homes based on the region that you live in. If you look at if you look at the homes in South Kent, they all look the same. You know, there's, there's mild variations, but they're all done by the same architects in the same areas. They've learnt the same styles of that area. You can't actually in most um, counties, you can't actually get a house designed that is that different from everyone else's because it will look, you know, out of place in in the local area. The council will not let you, you know, give will not give you planning permission for that. Many people will also um, move house much more often, no longer having the burden of having to own vast amounts of luggage, household appliances with short lifespans and trapped by mortgages or rent. And with much less per required due to access abundance, no more removal vans. No more breaking your back, you know, lifting your sofa downstairs to move to your... No more headaches that come, you know, with all that <laughs> moving all your gear. It's a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's supposed to be one of the most stressful things that we ever do in our lives. And yet we do it quite frequently, apparently. It's bizarre. Current homes are not designed for function, but are standardised based on current architectural trends in the area at that time. This is why house hunting can be such a laborious task in this system, because you're looking for a home that suits areas there has never been one designed specifically for them. So you go around various different homes and you say, oh, this one's quite nice, it's got a bigger dining area, it's great for me, I'm a cook, you know, and your, your missus says, yeah, but you know, I like my computers and I want a little study and I haven't got a study in this house. So then you move on to your next one, and eventually you find something that's, you know, it's there or thereabouts. It's, it's, yeah, it's got character, it's nice, I think we'll go with that home. But it still was never designed to meet your personal needs. I love these things. <laughs> Awful, aren't they? Home extensions, these are classic. This is a prime example of how homeowners attempt to make their homes more suitable for their own needs when they clearly wasn't in the first place. You simply wouldn't need to do this if the home was designed with your needs in mind before construction. Something that often comes up as a criticism of our ability to technologically develop the circular cities as proposed by Jacques Fresco uh, is of the automated construction. It's, you know, well, these big machines don't exist now, so therefore we can't make the cities, which means the Venus Project doesn't work, so let's go back to communism, or whatever. Um, the truth is that our construction methods at the moment, especially in the Western world, are actually quite well developed. There's no reason why these cities could not be built with our current construction methods. Whether or not they're actually designed, constructed, uh, and used on the first city using these automated systems, it really doesn't matter. The, the automated systems would likely be developed in the first resource-based economy city, or first TVP city. Um, that's something that would be a, a development project for building the next cities. So it's not a requirement, you know. It's, uh... In 2007, global food production was 8.5 trillion kilograms, or about 1.3 million kilograms per person. In 2007, the average American consumed 1,000 kilograms, and we have an obesity epidemic. Strange that. This implies that in 2007, we produced enough food to feed every man, woman, and child 1,000 times over, yet nearly, 1 million, sorry, yet nearly 1 billion people are starving. We don't have an overpopulation problem on this planet. We have a resource management, allocation, and distribution problem. To be blunt, we have a... <laughs> to be blunt, we have a technical and political problem. And there's no sign of this problem being solved in any other way than what we're advocating. This problem is global and affects everything from food supply to fresh water su supply to housing to clean renewable energies and even education. There is absolutely no logical reason with the technology that we have available to us today that we cannot provide all of these things as a basic human right instead of something that you have to earn. We could do so easily with our current technologies.
We will use the best technologies available to us at the time of design, whatever they may be at that time. Not simply those with the largest amount of existing profit or money demand. For energy supply, we would, be, we would use renewable energy systems such as solar, geothermal, volcanic, wind, wave, tidal, etc. These are all proven technologies and as yet unadopted because of, of the might of the economies of, uh, sorry, of the might of the economies and scale presently favoring oil and gas, and even the technologically simple coal industry. It's still running. Why? If you look at the current building construction, um, a typical high-rise office building can take from several months to a couple of years from preliminary design to finished construction drawings. Consisting of multiple companies such as architects, civil engineers, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, CAD technicians, project managers, and many, many more professions. That's just on the design side. You've then got to build the thing. In the system under which we currently live, those designers have families. They've got bills to pay, they've got rent to pay, they've got mortgages, they've got uh, you know, food bills, they've got electricity bills, they've got all the problems that you and I have that keep us going to work from nine to five, Monday to Friday, some of us Saturday and Sunday as well. The reason we haven't done the full designs for any of these cities so far is twofold. One, we don't have the funding to be able to take on full-time teams of architects, engineers, CAD technicians, etc. to work five days a week, eight hours a day to produce these drawings for the first city, which could take several months to a couple of years. Secondly, until we know actually where we're going to be building these cities, until we know what land we've got, what resources we've got in the local area, until we know what human resources we've got, how much funding we've got for technology, etc., it's almost impossible for us to actually take them past the visualization stage at the moment. The transition. This is the favorite question of anyone new to the movement and many of those within it. The truth is there is no single answer to the question of how will the transition play out. Until we know the actual conditions that we're facing at the time of this direction to be taken on board by a particular nation or group, or, 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 sorry, or, or group of nations, the variables involved in determining the most efficient and smooth transition from the monetary system to a resource-based economy are dynamically related to the conditions of the economy, of the existing infrastructure, of the location of transitioning countries, the resources available to them, the current debt obligations of those countries, and many, many other factors that would have to be analyzed and considered in developing a specific transitional approach. So until we actually get to a point where we've got a mass following, where we can actually force the arm of a government or a series of governments, nations, into a position where they're actually going to listen and, 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 and discuss a resource-based economy, there's very little we can do as far as the transition is concerned. There's so many variables involved in this transition and it's never been done before. There has never been a transition from a monetary system to a non-monetary system. It's been done the other way around. Before, you know, 10th, before a few thousand BC, there was no barter or trade. It was all hunter and gatherer societies and then we began the monetary systems. It's never been done the other way around, and it's not something that we've got a precedent that we can say, well, this is how we're gonna go, go ahead and do it. 